So uh, I'd like instead uh, of again getting into uh, this battle of you see definitions and scope of various instruments, uh, I'd like to give you a much broader outlook of what fields of international law relate to gene editing and, and in dealing with, ge with genome editing I'd, I'd also like to cover what, what in international debates has been qualified as synthetic biology. So basically the uh, com computerized creation of uh, DN DN D DNA without any biological source. Um, I'll have a brief, um, I'll make a brief, uh, again, uh, incursion trip into uh, domestic policy and le le legislation just in one area, one of the areas that I'm, that I'm going to cover under this outlook. Uh, in order to do what? Uh, not to understand what the precise scope of, a, of, a, of an instrument is, uh, but just to give you, a, a re, uh, a g again, a general outlook of what the main reg reg regulatory principles are. Why do we have certain instruments in uh, pl pl place? And, it, and uh, um, I think more importantly, what are the institutional dynamics behind those instruments? How do they evolve? I think this is, uh, to, to, to me, is a very important um, issue that uh, maybe we'll have the opportunity to address during this, during, during, during the, this three days, mostly to have an opportunity for scientists uh, to uh, interact more efficiently with policymakers uh, within uh, the various uh, global re regulatory processes. The first question. Why is this an international issue? Why at some point international law uh, reg regulates uh, a topic um, uh, somehow related to, um, uh, to genome editing and to, synth and to uh, synthetic biology? Um, there are a variety of re re reasons. This is not an exhaustive list. Uh, but. Uh, it might be sufficient to, of course, to refer to the global scale of the issues. Uh, in, in, the, um, uh, in this uh, sort of in initial writing uh, exercise, I think one of the observations was, but this relates to sustainable, uh, to sustainable agriculture. It relates to sustainable, to, to, to sustainable development. These are, these are issues of a global scale, where basically states need to cooperate with uh, States meaning uh, go go governments need uh, need to cooperate with each other. Um, that is also that is also more sort of trade oriented perspective. <coughs> uh, some of these regulated objects, for instance, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, genome uh, edited crop for, for variety in moves. Uh, it's part of uh, it's part of international trade. It's part of some kind of transboundary transfer, and as such, there might be issues, uh, legal responsibility, legal uh, accountability, also facilitation of trade, and of course, again, this uh, uh, introduces an international dimension into the um, into the debate. Uh, Another perspective is the fact that some of the resources that genome uh, editing uses or somehow relies on, uh, they are they, they generate inter interdependency in terms of access. And here with the, the we have the background of the international discourse on genetic resources, which exemplifies this, uh, in my opinion, very clearly. Uh, <coughs> A seed can be can be the can be the product of of uh, of a, a multinational corporation using very advanced uh, te technology, but s some parts of that seeds of that sort of plant seed they might uh, it might originate from the um, from the uh, uh, field of a traditional farmer in a in a, in a developing country. So this level of interdependency again brings forward the uh, international international dimension. A very generalized observation here. What is the value, what is the value proposition of an, of an instrument of international law? 
in this area, but probably not exclusively in this area. But let's keep uh, let's keep the focus. Um, again. I'm, I, I don't think that it, in this uh, uh, introductory overview we, uh, do, uh, it is the right time to discuss scope, to discuss uh, applicability of one treaty or uh, another. In general, the value propositions of an instrument of international law is twofold. Normative order, harmonization. So states agree on a certain set of norms that they uh, uh, agree to transpose into their into the domestic system and uh, up, up, apply and by having certain standards for those national measures will have will have some kind of global legal certainty for all the actors involved and will also have a level of uh, again of uh, uh, harmonization that again facilitates the operation of these actors Another value proposition is more dynamic, in my opinion, it is more process-oriented. Um, when we're dealing with the instruments that I'm going to present now, there is always a big debate about the science policy interface. So these instruments have uh, va value not just because they give a certain normative order, but they give an opportunity for science to interact with policy efficiently, of course, the other, the other way around, again, at a global scale. So it's a more process-oriented element that I think is also very useful uh, for us to consider. Uh, in broad strokes, uh, three main articulations of the international policy and legal framework uh, related to genome editing. Safety, innovation, equity. Is it safe or not? We are, we are, you have already, well, we haven't really debated this, but we have uh, related genome editing to the debate on, ge on the safety or non-safety of uh, 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 GM, of genetic, genetic, genetic modification. The second uh, main articulation, innovation. Uh, this is technology intensive, there are a lot of investments uh, public and, uh, and, pri and private sector, again, very broad stroke. So there is innovation. What are the legal incentives to innovation? And of course, intellectual property here plays uh, a, a major role. The third element is equity. Uh, it could be uh, economically efficient. It could be safe, but is this equitable? So it's a, it's a more so again, uh, so societal perspective. Is this equitable in a, in a north-south perspective, assuming that this is still actual, but uh, whatever, in the, in the, um, in the perspective of uh, de developed, developing countries, do they, have, do they have same issues? Do they have different issues? How, we, how can we reconcile this? And it's in this, it's in this area that the, that the uh, genetic resource re re regulatory framework mostly comes into play. These are the three main articulations at the level of uh, subject matter, if I may say so. Uh, what are the main institutional homes? Uh, international law is not, sh is not only made by, um, by tri treaties, it's also made by uh, international institutions, UN and non-UN. Non the main three institutional homes are environment, where, you, where we have the United Nations Environmental Program, trade, where we have the WTO, and agriculture, where we have FAO and many others, of course. Uh, what I'm, I'm, what I'm, I'm going to present in the next, in the next uh, sli sli slides uh, is not intended to be a complete outlook. There are many other foreign instruments other than, than the ones that I'm going to introduce here. Uh, you can. You can read the list of the instruments here, uh, WTO, SPS, TRIPS, and, and, and Nagoya Protocol. Um, there are other foreign instruments, that is a human rights perspective, that mostly relates to access to technology and to prior informed consent of traditional communities affected by the use of a certain, of a certain uh, te technology. Um, there is a human health uh, area as well, where of course WHO, most in relation to the use of um, uh, sequence data is, um, is taking a stand. So there is a very active debate 
uh, within WHO. I'm not going to cover this. I have to be uh, sel selective. Yeah, but say what is uh, the World <coughs> Health Organization. I know it's too many acronyms. I'm really sorry. But anyway, uh, so this is not an exo exhaustive. It's a very important category. Let's, let's have first a, fr uh, a, longitud a longitudinal examination of, the, of, the, of those three main articulations that, that um, uh, I'd like to cover. Uh, the WTO ag ag agreements, the agreements of the, uh, con concluded um, uh, in the various uh, global negotiations round and under the management or under the administration of the World Trade Organization. Uh, the agreement on sanitary and, phyto and, phyto and, phyto and phytosanitary measures and the agreement on uh, 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 technical barriers to trade. The objectives, what, what, what is the main purpose? To remove de facto trade, international trade, international trade barriers. I can, I can impose economic, um, economic disincentives if I don't want a certain uh, import, uh, but I can also use non-economic, uh, you see, disincentives to, to uh, contain import or to incentivize exports. And sanitary and photosanitary measures are one of those de facto barriers. Uh, what do these agreements regulate? They regulate the state measures. So the, actually the application of state measures. So before saying that a, that, a cert, that, a, that a certain shipment of a certain plant is not safe for import because it, uh, because it, it poses plant and, and, or, and new or unacceptable plant health risks, just to give you one ex example, I have to comply with certain standards. I cannot make, I, this uh, state decision cannot be arbitrary. And such, I've given you just one example. The scope of these instruments, it covers also not just uh, plant, plant life or, or health, it also covers human health uh, from the food safety perspective and animal health, of course, and zoonotic, zoonotic uh, diseases. In order to make the application of these state measures non-arbitrary, there are certain standards, uh, th th which, which, or certain sort of pr principles which then inform the technical standards. These principles are basically science-based. Okay, so before saying that, uh, that that something is not healthy for my uh, uh, for my uh, for the again for the um, uh, plant health or control system of my country, I need to apply certain scientific criteria. Uh, an important element in this area is that uh, is international standardization. So there are very precise international standards in all in, in all these three areas: plant life or health, animal health, and uh, 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 human health. Uh, again, from the food safety from the food safety angle. So you have international organizations and international instruments here, which basically dictate international standards. So if a state complies with those international standards, it automatically complies with the WTO, uh, with the WTO framework. So there is a level of, again, precision, so to speak, that is quite high. So the level of, the level of regulation in general terms is uh, uh, quite, you see, detailed. Now, um, for all the instruments that I'm going to present, I have the last part here that says issues under dis discussion. Uh, again, very broad categorization. Uh, the idea here is, and I've reviewed the literature and the official, uh, official documents of the international or organizations of a standard setting body, just to give you one example, is to give you a more sort of live outlook of how this how the discourse within this uh, re regulatory area is ev evolving. And I've deliberately selected areas that I think are of broad relevance to genome editing, to what we have heard also in the previous, in the previous, in the previous presentation. There is, uh, th there are, there is a, I think there is debate in li 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 literature on how to update risk assessment 
to cater for this new technological, te technological development. So I have a tool within my instrument. This tool is still useful. I just need to upgrade it to make it more to make it fine-tuned to cater for this new for this new for this new technology. Um, the international trade environment, the re regulatory env environment, again, broadly speaking, <laughs> has always been quite uh, re reluctant to embrace public perception, public participation issues in a way. Uh, it, it, it's a sector that marches to the beat of its own uh, drummers. There, has, there hasn't been a lot of, um, again, iter iter iteration, uh, a lot of uh, responsiveness to broader uh, so societal concerns in terms of public perception of this uh, re regulatory setting. In my opinion, this is slowly, this is slowly, this is slowly changing within this area, and the and the and the entry point. Uh, from a re regulatory perspective, is basically whether these agreements allow for the possible application of socioeconomic considerations. Again, the um, the sort of rationale or the uh, spell the rationale of this area is that everything is to be based on a s s s s science, but there is a little bit of openness now to uh, the application of socioeconomic considerations. And I think this is an important point that which is not science. That I also get back to. Sorry, which is which is not science. It cannot. From this, well, okay. from the again, of obviously it, 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 it is, but uh, it's not. It does not qualify as science in this uh, in this set. And I think that's that's uh, uh, it's, it's a useful obser obs observation. Uh, <laughs> another angle, uh, the Cartagena, pro again, we're still in the first area, safety. Uh, Cartagena protocol on, uh, on biosafety. Objectives to address environmental concerns posed by the introduction of living modified organisms through international trade. So there is an international trade perspective, but the focus is mostly on environmental issues. The object, the object of uh, regu 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 regulation here, it is, in a way, it is a physical object, so a living modified organism. Uh, the definition of a living modified organism, uh, the, uh, which of course refers to, uh, to, modern, to modern biotechnology as well, so we don't understand what an LMO is according to the Cartagena protocol if we don't examine also the definition of modern biotechnology. Uh, here you have some, you have a, a broad definition of the of the of the, of the scope. It, in, it might include some uh, genome edited foods, those uh, through a simplified uh, through a simplified uh, re regime. It, it excludes s uh, some of the commodities and some of the products that are that are still a, a biological origin, uh, but that uh, that are part of the international international. <coughs> the re the re regulatory. Uh, approach before importing an LMO, a country must know that they are importing an LM LMO and they need to know it in advance in order to conduct a proper environmental risk assessment and basically uh, um, have the right to say yes or no. In conducting their own risk assessment, uh, they can, they can um, adopt their pre precautionary principle. This is the main difference between the, uh, between the Cartagena protocol and the SPS ag 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 agreement. Even if there is scientific uncertainty about the risks, the unintended effect of these potential risks are <coughs> sufficient for me to say, as a country, no, I don't want this stuff on my, on my territory. I can't say no based on this uh, precautionary uh, approach. Fundamental consideration. There's no international standard. In plant health, according to, uh, uh, to the SPS uh, agreement, I can go back to uh, the 26 some standards of International Plant Protection Convention. Uh, OECD has conducted some uh, standa standardization on environmental risk assessment, but basically there is no 
there is no sort of blueprint for this uh, for this environmental risk assessment, at least as an official stand, as an internationally endorsed official standard. Issues under discussion. This is probably the area where genome editing has um, has, has entered very actively. The uh, 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 again the deb deb debate and the process for implementation of this instrument. Uh, from uh, from uh, from what perspectives? Whether the, whether basically uh, the, the definition of LMO applies or or, or or not? Whether the precautionary principle is still a valid tool in order to to handle the risks related to um, to genome uh, uh, <coughs> edited crops? Uh, in general, it has been it has been emphasized based on best practice at the national level that there is a need to update the tools for risk uh, as, as assessment. So basically, uh, you see uh, the equipment, you see the methodology, and the, and the and the, and, the, and the foundational uh, concepts uh, um, underpinning uh, bio biosafety are still valid. We just need to update, and this is a similarity with the SPS ag 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 agreement. This has been an area where, where the conflicts, where tensions with private sector perspectives have always been uh, particularly heightened, particularly high. Uh, industry, in general terms, they do not like the biosafety protocol. <laughs> but, but now I think there is an attempt by the environmental community, this is an environmental ag 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 agreement, to be to open up new avenues for dialogue with private sector, for instance, on the on the sort of monitoring of of of, uh, of genome edited products uh, once they are once they are uh, uh, introduced, and there is also the the prior informed consent perspective for indigenous communities in the human rights discourse. I'm not covering this. Unfortunately, due to uh, due to due to lack lack la 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 lack of time, but in the human rights sector, the, the 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 sort of headline in this area is access access to uh, access to technologies. So I say, okay, but what is the possibility for traditional farmers, for subsistence farmers, to access and benefit from from this technology? In this instrument, the perspective is slightly different. It says. If those communities are affected, they, again, they have the right to say no. And uh, th th this is, uh, this is a, a, a topic for, di for a discussion that has been opened um, uh, within the Convention on Biological Diversity and the, and the, particular, and the particular body that is responsible for the, for the Cartagena Protocol. Now, uh, in the area of safety, the role of national regulation, in my opinion, is fundamental because there are um, there is a level of uh, harmonization at the level of in international law, but for WTO is minimal standards, so you can always go ab above if you have cert if you respect certain uh, pri 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 principles. But in, in general, this level of har har harmonization leaves a lot of room for different regulatory approaches at the national level. Uh, Again, a very rapid ov ov overview. Uh, the U.S. system is largely based on product-based definitions and the, on the application of sectoral, sectoral legislation. So, for instance, under uh, APHIS, under the, under the plant health uh, si 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 system, I need to conduct a risk asset assessment for a, for a genome edited uh, pro product if that insertion qualifies as a plant test. Under the EPA regulations, under the environmental, environmental regulations, I have to see whether it's a plant incorporated uh, prote protectant. So anyway, there is this, there's basically qualification on a sectoral basis on whether the object is a regulated article or not. Canada adopts a, adopts a, 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 a technology neutral approach. Okay, so this is entirely product based. I need to look into the possible risks of a, of a genome uh, edited product if that product constitutes a novel trait. It doesn't matter whether 
this novel trait has been generated by any form of particular of, of particular 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 technology. If this product, again the end product, contains a novel trait that, uh, from a risk assessment per, per, per perspective, somehow introduces a, a novel element, then I, I need to conduct some pre-market uh, approval. The EU. Uh, lot of the, the combines horizontal legislation on uh, on bio on, bi on biotechnology, uh, European Directive of uh, two, 2001, with sectoral product uh, product legislation for the food safety. Just to give you one uh, ex ex example. In, in general terms, it's a more process oriented <coughs> regulation. So I regulate the technology. I don't regulate the pro or I, I regulate both the technology and the product because the two because the two definitions that activate that trigger the uh, re regulatory setting combine the two. Uh, several develop uh, some recent developments. Actually, there are a lot of developments: Arge Argentina, Chile, uh, Brazil, mm -hmm. Australia, just to name uh, a, a, a few. Argentina has a process-based re regulatory system, and and they have. A they are applying it on a case-by-case -case basis based on certain, again, on certain trigger point on, uh, on, on to uh, evaluate the risks posed by genome-edited crops. Australia is conducting a, a, regulatory, a re regulatory review of the gene technology regulation and on the food standards code. Uh, again, uh, two examples of, of, the, of the movement that we are somehow witnessing, that we are re registering in national regulatory uh, authorities. Um, now, uh, from a practical perspective, all the differences that, 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 that I've uh, uh, briefly pre 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 presented concerning the regulation of, of uh, basically of GMOs Broadly speaking, they are likely to again to perpetuate or to, to, to be extended to the possible regulation or non regulation of, of uh, genome uh, ed editing. For instance, whether a precautionary uh, approach, the EU legislation adopts a precautionary approach, the US, the US legislation does not, whether the precautionary ap ap approach will, sti will be applied to, uh, to uh, genome ed ed editing, the, the uh, det determination of the level of acceptable risk, the uh, possible, consider the possible uh, evaluation of social econo e e economic consideration, risk management uh, sol solutions. Uh, in, some, in some regulations, it's a state authority that conducts post-monitoring, post-approval uh, modern monitoring in order to manage risks. Uh, in other countries, it's the same um, entity that has basically commercialized, that has basically introduced uh, the, um, the uh, reg regulated uh, ar article. So this different genome editing is not going to erase these differences. Okay, they're, they're likely, they're, they are likely to continue at the level of national re regulatory mechanisms. Nevertheless, I think an important consideration is that these di di differences, uh, which again uh, largely re re revolve around uh, the, the, the 20 years, 30 years of debate over, over, over uh, GM, 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 GMOs, they, not, they do not need to be overemphasized because some of the fundamental, in, uh, I found some uh, re references in uh, qualified literature about this. The fundamental methodology is still the same. So I have the idea of comparing something new with something that already exists in order to see whether it poses new risks or not. Uh, there is, a, uh, of course, mandatory compliance with certain international, inter, in, uh, international standards. And I still have the idea of giving a definition, either to the, to the technology or to the product. In synthetic biology, just to give you one uh, example, this is the idea of co comparing something new with something that already exists might be under serious scrutiny because, because, uh, because you don't have any biological source for, uh, for, for synthetic DNA. DNA. So, so with what would you compare that? Just to give you 
uh, one of the many one of the many questions that are being asked in this uh, area. Uh, there's no rapid solution to these issues. So, in an um, in an evolutionary perspective, I think it's fair to say that all these differences again will you see perpetuate the societal and economic considerations between these differences, they will still inform the new debate over genome uh, ed ed editing. And conflicts, conflicts also is escalating to form a dispute uh, set 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 settlement under international ag agreements, they are likely to continue. So there's not going to be a world position, right? All these differences uh, from a policy and a regulatory perspective, they will continue. I have to speed up, so. Now, uh, the second perspective, innovation, intellectual property. WTO, WTO TRIPS, the TRIPS uh, uh, ag ag agreement. Again, international trade uh, pers perspective to minimize de facto uh, trade uh, bar bar barriers to have minimal standards of IP, of IP pro 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 protection, to incentivize international trade through an appropriate protection to the interest of technology developers. In a nutshell, this is the essence. This is the, uh, I think, the core element of IP global regulation. Uh, the idea here, when you read a publication about the TRIPS agreement, about intellectual property and syn synthetic bi biology, uh, uh, about the uh, uh, patentability of uh, uh, informatic software to scan genomics data more efficiently, just to give you one example, they, they can go very deep into the, into the, uh, uh, into the technical aspects, into the minutia, but you still come out with the idea that these experts, the uh, country delegates sitting in the WTO TRIPS uh, Council, they think that basically patents and intellectual property are the most important tool for Governance for it for in international governance. If you um, address um, uh, interests revolving around uh, around pa pa patents, if you find the right uh, pa balance between the, these competing interests, you will address most of the governance uh, most of the governance aspects. You will have equity. You will have so 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 societal pro uh, pro progress. You will have an ideal. Uh, uh, iter iteration between public and private sector. You, you will do a lot of a lot of things, but only if you discuss IP. Now, uh, this new technology in general, how is it uh, somehow re reshuffling the discourse? First of all, there is there is this idea of well, a synthetic biology pat patentable, pro uh, a synthetic biology inno 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 innovation. It carries. Uh, so many layers of uh, uh, pro 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 property, it's almost impossible for a scientist to uh, innovate because there is basically there is an overly proprietary, uh, you see, setting. So, the, the, so this this idea of of the patent of the patent tickets, for instance, one patent stacked over a, 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 another. How do I have freedom to operate? And under the under the, uh, again, the uh, synthetic biology spur debate is, is bringing new inputs, new re ref 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 reflections into this question. It is, it's so, it is also addressing the issue of how, how can I apply general IP criteria to this new form of in in innovation? Is software patentable or, or not? Is it time to open up uh, uh, to the idea of uh, copyright over over sequence over sequence over sequence data, just to give you two ex ex examples, there are also many other considerations. Uh, I need to incentivize this uh, te 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 technology, open up to any form of IP pr pr protection, because th because that's what the competing country is doing. So, uh, geo geo geopolitics will shape. 
uh, will shape will shape will shape will shape will shape debate. In the past, there have been many attempts to harmonize this area of international law, innovation, intellectual property, with the environmental com component of the uh, of the other area. So, Convention on Biological Diversity, and more specifically. Uh, well, the, 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 a, the APS com component. There was a lot of enthusiasm for this coordination between the two sectors. It never led to any, to any, to any positive, to any, to any positive result. So, the, a, any attempt to formally coordinate these two areas of law have, has not resorted to any, uh, to any material progress at the level of, at the level of global government. Um, open data and uh, IP. Another pressure point on the on the in intellectual property is this big open data movement that is, that is coming. So this idea that in, in that this technological revolution is information inter inter in intensive. Information should should be should not be subject to any particular form of pr property. Should be open. So this idea of open uh, uh, access. A lot of confusion. I think that is the message that I that I have for you. Openness in itself doesn't mean anything. I can have open access to something that I cannot use. Open source. So this idea of openness is still based on a certain uh, management of intellectual assets. So there is still a pro 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 proprietary uh, element. Uh, these are the two areas where basically the open data movement is trying to coordinate with in intellectual in intellectual property. What is interesting to note here is that uh, in the past, this debate around open data and intellectual property has always been addressed more at as the uh, open operational level. So, what are the what are the mechanics? What are the incentives and disincentives within a certain collaboration setting? for private sector to share their data, for researchers to make sure that they can still, you see, publish, uh, uh, but they give uh, full access uh, in public domain mode to their de 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 data. It is escalating to the level of global governance solutions. You take the example of uh, Godan and uh, sort of soft law initiative, uh, so, to, so to speak. They are of the opinion that this sort of licensing and cross-licensing schemes, that this uh, complex uh, clauses in, in consortium uh, ag ag agreements, they are not enough to address this problem, and we need states to take up a pos position. So this is a, an area where the where the where the debate is rising to the level of a global governance issue. Last, uh, the third uh, area, access and benefit sharing, genetic resources, equity. The objectives of this instrument are those that you can find here. What is regulated under this area of international law? The resource. It's not the technology, it's not the means of protection, it's the resource in itself. It's genetic uh, 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 resources which are qualified as an input into the research and development and development and development process by regulating the resource through a, a different stacks of uh, pro pro property i don't have we'll have time to uh, to get into the details but in general there is the idea that there is a state sovereignty there is the uh, there is ownership and there is a certain exercise of this ownership that that brings uh, fa fa fairness prior informed consent and mutually agreed terms. Uh, it's still, it's still transaction-based. So I'll give you this resource, you give me something back. Uh, if you commercialize a product that contains this genetic resource that I'm transferring to you, you, you owe me, you see, money based on the, on the success of your, of, your, of your commercial product. Um, so this idea of equity linked to reciprocity. This is, uh, the, this is again a fundamental re regulatory principle, a fundamental value proposition in this uh, area. I've heard before a lot of uh, interest about the ongoing debate in these instruments on whether the original scope, genetic resources, 
So something with a material component ext extends to data or, or not. So there is a lot of debate on basically on trying to extend the scope of these agre agreements in areas that, that if not covered by the regulatory setting will make these instruments irrelevant. And one of the final slides in the previous presentation has explained this very uh, cl cl clearly. Um, there is also a strong um, uh, sort of strong positioning by, by, by pre-comparative research sectors, too much state sovereignty over, over the re res re resources, no matter whether still the old genetic resources or the, or the new data, they are going to, uh, they are going to hinder uh, re research. I won't be able to do anything because I have the state telling me that I cannot touch this. And it, in general, there is this idea of trying to pull these resources into, again, into these pools and find a multilateral solution. So it is transaction based, but it's, more, it's not anymore in one-to-one one -one negotiation. There is this tendency in, in this sector to address the issues posed by new technology by finding global regulatory solution based on the pooling of these uh, re 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 resources by the state governments, basically. Now, uh, let me go back to the initial two value <coughs> propositions. These are the last two slides. Sorry. Uh, normative order and, uh, and uh, science policy interface. You remember the two original value uh, pro pro proposition that I suggested for these two, um, uh, for the three uh, areas of international policy and law that I've uh, ex ex examined. Uh, trade has partially addressed the environment unsu unsuccessfully. Environment is tried to address the intellectual property uh, aspects. Agriculture has done a little bit of both in a very inefficient way. Uh, this, has, this has basically produced a certain hybridization of policy, of, of, policy, of policy framework. If I have to examine the global settings of intellectual property, I'll start from TRIPS, but then I need to look at the, at the, at the CPD and reversely. Now, this has been incentivized by multiple institutional and legal, you see, disalignments. There is no exclusive home for environment. There is no exclusive home for uh, agriculture, just to give you one uh, ex example. The, trip, uh, the WTO ag uh, agreements, they have very stringent provisions on enforcement and dispute settlements. So they are truly, mm, enforceable agreements of uh, international law. We cannot say the same about the environmental agreements in, in general. So these, are, these kind of institution, institutional disalignments have probably produced some kind of, you see, disequilibrium, at least at a, at a superficial examination, and have produced a certain hybridization of these policy frameworks of the different uh, re re regulatory, regulatory, regulatory principles. Um, I've heard this already probably uh, for the, a, a lot in the first three hours of our of our three day of our three day course. Are they GMOs or not or not GMOs? Do we need to regulate or, or we do we do not we do not need to regulate? Now, some lessons learned <laughs> under this uh, under this hybridization of, of, of policy frameworks maybe can be useful here. The the for 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 instance. All the debates around GMOs have been polarized and around the idea of science versus non-science. So I regulate if I have a scientific basis. I do not regulate if I, have an, if I don't have enough scientific power. Maybe this new technology poses some broader societal issues that, that we cannot capture under the dilemma whether to regulate or not to regulate. Uh, certainly what we have witnessed in this, in these three areas, and what we are also witnessing in the attempts to uh, to to make this instrument still relevant to the new to the new te 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 technology, is a very limited ability of international organizations. A few, this is the last slide. A few uh, policy and legal things. Um, let me focus. On this one, we tend to think we tend to think we tend to reconcile different areas of international law on this old on this old par paradigm. There is fragmentation. 
I have to look at five different instruments. One institution is doing one thing, another institution is doing an, 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 another thing. An agreement says one thing, another agreement says another thing. How do I reconcile the two, set of, the two sets of obli ob obligations? So this idea of fragmentation, which is addressed how? Either by formal, by formal coordination, one example, Nagoya and Treaty now march uh, hand in hand, happily, uh, formally. Unification, I bring all the pesticides uh, re regime under one umbra 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 umbrella. There are, some, there are some new theories here developed in the area of international env env environmental law. It's good for these different policy frameworks to be hybridized. It's, it's good. They are, they are adaptive systems. They are adaptive systems. International environmental law, just to give you one example, 747 agreements of international inv 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 environmental law. They have been self-organized in clusters and somehow they have still been able to advance inter international environmental law discourse. So I can let this is these different instruments adapt, but I need someone to drive this kind of legal, you see, legal, you see, federalism. Maybe the SDGs will be an opportunity to do, to do this. But who, who drives this? The, the new sustainable development goals is overarching the sort of secondary rule, this big rule saying, OK, I need to address sustainable, su su sustainable development. This is good. It can lead to some kind of coordination of this different hybrid, um, hybridized policy framework. But who drives it? Certainly not international, international orga, orga, orga organizations. Maybe the states. Maybe yes, maybe not. Why? Because in the end, there is, there is a, the, the, all this witnesses a certain, the, the, the new technology witnesses a certain crisis of, of the paradigm of national sovereignty, which is still the foundation of international inv 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 environmental law. It's good to, in, in my opinion, we don't need to crack our heads trying to understand how to formally coordinate everything. We let the systems ev evolve. The different stakeholders will select the norms and the fora where it's, where it's most suitable for them to advance their issues. And in order to do this, we need to improve coordination within the same instruments. This idea is not to create a new global order by having an overarching instrument. This idea of, is to let these different instruments evolve, but to improve the coordination between actors, stakeholders, and institutions on the one hand, and the decision-making nodes. We do not have a lot. We do not have much research on how these conventions are self-organized. What are the social organizational processes within the convention? Maybe we need to explore this a little bit, uh, sort of more. You, you see deeply to make sure that this, that that in the end, through the complex adaptation of different systems, will still have relevance for global governance, for global policy, and for global law. Thank you, and uh, Thank you. questions after, maybe uh, after lunch. Over